Good morning, um, and welcome to our second uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration. Um, it's a glorious day for such an historical event, because this is the first year we're actually selling, uh, celebrating Asian Heritage Month. And um, I'll give you a little bit of information on Professor Chang from UMass Dartmouth. Uh, he went to the University of Washington for his bachelor, uh, and Harvard, um, Harvard University for his PhD in history. Uh, he speaks Japanese and Mandarin, a little bit of Japanese. Chinese. <laughs> <Japanese. laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, also, he's the editor of the first Encyclopedia of China. Uh, and it's a, it's a culmination of all the scholars from Europe, from Asia, and also the United States. So it's a privilege to have him here. And also, he's, he wrote a book on uh, modern banking. He does a lot of research in China. Actually, a few weeks ago, he, he was in China. <laughs> he recently uh, came back. And he's been a professor at UMass Dartmouth for about 17 years or more. Um, 18. And he's also uh, an associate of research at Harvard University East Asian Center. Um, and most importantly, he's a great professor and advisor. I had the privilege of being one of his students. And I would always go to Professor Chang for any advisement I would need for class. So um, let me give the mic to Dr. Chang. Thank you. <clears throat> and it's a great, a great honor to, to be here to give a talk about uh, uh, Chang. And, uh, uh, <clears throat> So, but uh, uh, maybe before I start, I got to really apologize because uh, basically I prepared for the students, and but I, I looks like we have many many faculties here, the most faculties here. So, sorry. Maybe, <laughs> and maybe if you say, oh, it's just, uh, we already know everything. So, sorry. Maybe <laughs> this because I in the beginning I just saw according to my students. The, the lab, I, I just try to make sure and students can understand. So for faculties, okay, sorry, for, well, maybe it's a tool to, to, <laughs> to share. Anyway, today's topic is about China's emergence and uh, America's opportunity. Because today's uh, uh, the, the, the world, I, I guess, is quite a, you know, I should do this one. Where to go? <clears throat> anyway, so first, as I say, you know, we should. And uh, when we talk about China, and today, you know, unlike the maybe 18 years ago when I first started teaching uh, at the UMass Dartmouth, at that time, maybe it's a different story. Today, of course, everybody knew that. And uh, uh, China is quite important, quite, quite important. And uh, for, particularly for us to, uh, to know about China a little more, and of course, there are huge, uh, many, many, many reasons why we need to know more about China, and particularly for American people. You know, I often told my students that and in today's world, and uh, if you know nothing about China, and uh, it's hard to say you are a really educated person, <laughs> because the China actually right now is really closely and uh, involved in the world, uh, in the world, the ever, ever, everywhere, everywhere. And you can also see that in America. And news and TVs, also newspapers, and you can find so many uh, reports, uh, so many news about uh, China, good or bad. Like if you read, I know that many people may <laughs> notice that some kind of scandal in China uh, occurred. But of course, the more important reason I, 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 I list some some of them here. Yeah. The China, because why we need to know about China, because China is large, but China is the third largest country in the world, and even a little larger than America. Than America. And uh, China also, of course, if you know nothing about China, you at least you know that uh, China's the most popular country in, in the world. You know, right now, 1.3 billion people, like 1.3 billion people, actually, uh, more than four and a half times as America. As America. And also because, not because only size or the population, and also because China is a uh, we can see the only continuous civilization in the world. You know, we can see that uh, we have the ancient civilizations in Egypt, in Middle East, 
But if we talk about the, the sterilization and really continue that without the big change, actually in China, in China. And uh, of course, even for this part, okay, I can talk the one lecture, the one, one, one hour. But of course, right now, for today's topic, I really want to focus on and today's China, but today's China, because another, another reason for us to uh, understand, to know a little more about China, is because China is emerging. But China's emerging China really provided America a great opportunity in every aspect, as I'm going to uh, uh, talk. <coughs> Where to go? You know, when we talk about China's emerging, actually it's maybe not really accurate, because uh, maybe I, I should say China's re-emerging, because China actually before the 18th century, I always say that China is one of the, at least one of the, the, the greatest uh, uh, the, the, uh, countries in the world, or the richest country in the world. And, uh, <laughs> uh, at that time, in this kind of so-called 5,000 years of history, China really contributed a lot to the world civilization, to world civilization in sciences, in technology, and also China really laid the world for more than 1,000 years. And like everybody knew that today, America, of course, the leader of the world, world leader. But how long? And maybe about 100 years, about 100 years. But actually before that time, and China really kind of the lead the world for more than 1,000 years, and also contributed a lot to in almost every aspect of the human life, the human life. China actually really declined after the late 18th century. Uh, of course, many, many reasons. <laughs> and uh, that's actually the one uh, semester I'm teaching about the modern China. We talked about why China really uh, declined. So many, many reasons, of course, including, like I hear, I used to hear that, that for the invasion, when China was uh, declining, and the whole world, in particular after Britain's uh, industrialization, the other countries are really, uh, 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 really emerging. So China is really declined. And at that time, you know, believe it or not, uh, China was actually defeated by the, the Britain, by the France, by the uh, uh, Russia, by the, <laughs> by the Japan, particularly by Japan, for many, many times. And uh, even China capital was occupied by the foreign troops three times, at least, in the modern period. Like in the 1850s, in the, 18, in the 1900s, and also in the 1930s, 1930s. So China is really, really kind of a very, very uh, the weak uh, uh, in, the, in the modern time, in the modern time. Of course, this is a foreign invasion is only the one, 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 one problem for China. Actually, more serious problem for China at that time is China, the government, the efficiency and the official corruption. So when we talk about the official e e uh, corruption and uh, I guess it's a very hard hard you can find any other other countries that can compare with uh, with China uh, in the official corruption. So at that time, the, the uh, emperors in China at that time still had emperors, like the emperors. The emperor really the only care about uh, 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 himself and also for the, the China had the largest uh, bureaucratic system. This bureaucratic system also when the, uh, uh, the Chinese actually were waking, almost everybody go their own way. So official corruption also caused a big problem for China, for, for, for China. So this kind of situation actually at that time, I would say, before the uh, middle of the 20th century, and uh, the China was so weak, China actually is one of the poorest countries in the world. And from the richest country in, in the world, okay, in the 18th century. In the 18th century, you know, we talk about the America that uh, plays the uh, strengths, right? And actually, America that right now, if you talk about the GDP, American GDP right now is about like 25%, right? 22, 25% of the world GDP. But China at that time, in the 18th century, according to the research, and about 40% of the world GDP. But then actually, from the 18th century down to the 20th century, and China really became the one of the poorest country in the world. So that's what I think is, uh, uh, if we talk about today's China, we really talk about the re-emergence of China. Because uh, another, of course, another problem for the rebellion is the political struggles. Because China, you know, when China actually uh, uh, <coughs> weakening, and the government actually <coughs> didn't care about the common people, and the foreign uh, invasions all caused big trouble for the common people. 
the so common people suffer the most. So China, of course, the common people, when you have no way to live, what can you do? Go to rebellion. So China also have, the, in the modern time, China also has the largest, in size, largest rebellions in the whole world. We talk about that sometimes in the 19th century, some rebellion involved more than 100 million people. You cannot imagine, but 100 million people were involved in the rebellion. So anyway, by the 50s, by 1950s, and China finally, as China's uh, the leader, the Mao, and uh, claimed that, okay, China finally stand up. Okay, for a while, the China is true, they're quite good. And for maybe five, six, uh, six seven years, and China looks like actually no war, no, 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 no kind of hunger, at least. Even though China was still poor, but the China still actually, at least, everybody had food to eat, clothes, uh, the clothes to, to wear, and the house to, to live, and also no war. So it looks like good, but the Mao and uh, really continued the so-called political struggle. And he launched one political campaign after another, really led China into a kind of disaster. You know, always I told my students that if Mao, I, I guess everyone knew that about the Mao, and uh, if Mao died in 1956, and uh, the history will really record that he is the greatest leader in China because he true. He really brought China back to independence, and he brought China to a kind of peace and order. But unfortunately, he lived 20 years longer. And <laughs> it's true, okay, the 20 years, in this 20 years, and he really led China, okay, into one disaster after another. And finally, I will say, China by the time when Mao, uh, 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 when Mao died, and China was in the brink of bankruptcy. But at that time, in the international speaking, China had no ally at all. In America, in Paris. Russia is a new in Paris. And all other countries, America is a gloomy dog. Nothing, okay, almost nothing. No, no country is an ally of China at the time. And of course, the, again, as I by that time, and China once again became one of the poorest countries in the world. And I, I, I will leave it there. I will, I grew up in China. I knew how, how difficult that situation uh, uh, there. Uh, plus, any political struggles and uh, prevent China from making any progress. So, China, when we talk about the so called re emergence of China, actually started from 1978 when the Deng Xiaoping uh, started so called China's Second Revolution. And the Deng Xiaoping, uh, the, 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 the leader, the Chinese called primary leader. Uh, after the Mao, after Mao. So after that, it took it a real change. Everything changed in China. Of course, the most important change in China uh, it occurred in economic field. Because China problem always uh, accept other problems. There's so many problems. But the biggest problem uh, always uh, is the poverty, absolute poverty, absolute poverty. And at that time, I was perfect. Often ask my students, my students that do you have actually really have kind of what I mean the hunger, really hungry, and I really, really know that what I mean the hungry in China at, at the time, particularly the so-called the Great Leap Forward time. Anyway, so because this is so poor, and China was so poor, but under Mao and Mao still concentrated on the political struggle, and really don't care about the economic development. So Deng Xiaoping's so-called reform, or so-called China's second revolution, really started to change economic system. And this all kind of change was start from agriculture, from the countryside. Because China's countryside and the peasants are even more even poor. And I said, when we talk about the poor, poor, and this kind of absolute poverty, when we talk about the people, and you cannot find, cannot find any food for your children. And uh, so that's uh, really terrible. You know, any time we have some kind of the, the, the natural disaster, hundreds of thousands of people have died, died, died. And like I mean, some of you might also knew that in the so-called uh, Great Leap Forward period, and 20 million people actually died of starvation. This is actually really the worst and, uh, uh, disaster, worst uh, the failure in the world. So Deng Xiaoping is actually the, the so-called second revolution started in, in countryside, in countryside. And we say like uh, eliminate the people's commune. Because at that time, in the early second, we talk, talk about so-called uh, 
household responsibility system. It changed from the people's commune to the household responsibility system. Or I list here, looks like in America, it, of course, you call should, should and everybody should be responsible for yourself. And uh, everybody, if you can work hard, you can get more. And uh, if you have the surplus, of course you can you can resell your surplus products uh, in the free market. In the free market, but looks like it's natural, right? The natural in America, but not in China because under the people's community system, and uh, almost everything, everything was set and planned by the leader, by the top leader. And he was in Beijing, and he gave kind of planning, but actually he didn't really understand that every local area has a different situation. And for example, if you really believe that in this place, and you really need to, to like the, 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 the group, group kind of a, the soybean, for example. But if the leader said, okay, you must uh, the, the cultivate the rice, even though this area actually cannot really cultivate the rice, and uh, but what? What, 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 what happened? You got to go, you got to follow, you follow the order of the, of the people community. So in this case, of course, and the uh, plus or plus, and uh, no matter how you work, how, how hard you are, and you cannot get any, any more than people who actually don't work. So in this case, nobody really interested in working hard in the agriculture. So the Deng Xiaoping's this kind of form actually really turned and this kind of people commute into the so-called household responsibility system. So which means that okay, if you put the simple is that, okay, you've got to be responsible for yourself. Right? You've got to be responsible for yourself. If you work hard, you can get the more and you can really improve your life, improve your life. But also, as I said, believe it or not, at that time, when it's stuck, and people really risk their life. You know, the first group of people uh, who divide their land among themselves and to be responsible for themselves, and they really the secret. The secret is they sign a kind of contract with their blood, with their blood, and to really uh, 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 claim that, okay, we did it, okay, for our voluntary do it. So if later on, uh, the government found and punish us, and uh, arrest us, and it's other people, okay? Other people have a responsibility and to, uh, to, to really help to raise my children, my children. And by the way, this country is still preserved in Chinese Museum right now, okay? But anyway, this kind of, kind of uh, uh, the, the reform looks like actually, it's simple, right, simple, but it's true. And the Chinese people actually very, worked actually very hard. You know, you cannot doubt and Chinese, uh, the peasants actually uh, maybe the hardest worker in the world. And uh, because once you give them kind of a, a little incentive, a little kind of a, the right, a right uh, to do what they want, and they actually really generated the, the unbelievable kind of a, a result. Like as you can see, right, from 79 to 84, and the farm output rise by 8 to 10 percent a year. The peasants net real income lowered by almost 80% a year. And uh, remember, before that, you know, people can, cannot have enough food to eat, right? The real income, okay, 800 million people, I'm talking about 800 million people, really increased 100% in six years, in six years. After that, actually, and of course, the situation can, uh, keep can, uh, uh, changing, but at least, the right now, for, if, if, for in the Chinese countryside, if you go there, you can find okay, at least everybody can have enough food to eat. You know, I remember several years ago, 10 years ago, some American professors <laughs> read a book, published a book, and the title is that, okay, who can feed China? Because the Chinese the land is very limited, not enough land. And uh, he really worried about it. He believed that, okay, China's land is not enough to feed enough Chinese. So if China can, cannot feed himself, who else can feed? We talk about one billion people at that time, at least one billion people. Even America cannot feed, right? And even America has about, America has the same kind, similar size of, uh, of land, territory as Chinese. But America actually have the, about the three times uh, of the, China, uh, the cultivated land. So China actually, of course, cut, cut, they, they really real worry about, okay, China could not and, uh, provide enough food for its own people. So then we caused the biggest disaster for the world. But in reality that, 
you know, after the kind of revolution, uh, after kind of, uh, so called uh, economic revolution, and China, today's Chinese food very, very cheap, too cheap. Right now, it's another problem for Chinese peasants that, and the food price is too cheap. So <laughs> that's another problem, of course, much better than the, uh, than the uh, problem actually with no, no food. You know, I, I always told my students, if you go there, and you can have quite a good, good banquet, and in, in a quite, quite a, quite a good, good restaurant, uh, with the price, and maybe only kind of McDonald's you're, you're eating here in McDonald's. Anyway, so in, in this case, okay, it's true. And uh, if you like to feed uh, 10 people, okay, in a good, quite a good restaurant, you can pay like in McDonald's uh, the, the price. Anyway, this is only, of course, this is the, the, the countryside. I'm talking about the 800 million people that really improve their life. But of course, more challenging work is uh, in the inner city. Because China at that time, and almost all the Chinese, the, the, the factories, all the Chinese companies, belong to government, belong to government, and no private companies at all, no private enterprise at all. And of course, China also knew that. You know, agriculture can only solve the problem of the, China, of the food. You can feed, right? You can at least you don't, no, no, no longer hunger. But if you want to really rich, you still need industry, industry, industrial development. So, but industrial development, of course, again, it's very difficult for China. Again, there's also no incentive for people to really work hard. You know, before I uh, start my, my, uh, the, the, uh, the, what kind of stuff, I, I go to the school, okay, before I go to the great school, and I worked in a factory, in a factory, okay, for 10 years. I really knew then how it worked. Because, uh, again, everything actually planned by the, the central government. And the government give you what kind of machine you got, you got, you got to uh, 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 produce, and how much, how many machines you got to pr pr produce. Also happened, okay. And when the last years the, the product is still in the in the in the warehouse and rusting, and but this year we have the more, we must produce more because it's actually according to plan. And of course, good part of that, okay. Of course, you can say always the bad part. Okay? Good part of that. We call talk about the iron rice ball because no matter what I'm doing, I can get my salary. Even the salary is low, is low okay, but at least I can have the salary. And uh, even I'm lazy, doesn't matter. But who cares? Because the manager has no right to fire, to fire. And <laughs> you can really enjoy your life from your uh, 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 from your, if it, once you get the uh, job. So Deng Xiaoping's policy, of course, so called the, so the reform or the revolution. It will smash the iron rice ball. Again, now the, all these kind of enterprises, the so called state owned prices, and you got to really make your pro uh, products uh, uh, <laughs> useful for in, in the market, sellable in the, in the market. If you can sell the, your product in the market, okay, you can make money. You can uh, get, uh, pay, pay more uh, uh, the salary or the bonus and to, your, uh, to, your, to your workers. And otherwise, and you go bankrupt. But no longer, okay, the government will provide you kind of enough funding or, or, <laughs> or, or kind of give you a kind of plan. Whatever you do, okay, you go to the market, to the market, to see the market in need you or not. So in this case, so there is a real emphasis on the way to real build, of course, the Chinese always Chinese, because we talk about the socialist market economy. Socialist market economy, okay. But at least, okay, this is a market economy. And uh, uh, for socialists, uh, this part, okay, uh, we can discuss uh, uh, later on. So in this case, okay, this will force the hundreds of thousands of kind of uh, the so-called state-owned uh, uh, enterprises. And you've got to work hard to find the market and to work for the market. And this actually really uh, increased their productivity. Plus, they also, when talk about market, of course, introduce competition. So before the 1978, you can say nobody actually in China really run uh, uh, private enterprises. Uh, 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 prices. And actually, believe it or not, in the, in the beginning when China began to began to uh, uh, change, and uh, like I'm, I, I, at that time I was already in my graduate school in, in, uh, at that time. So the rich people and always those people who actually just came from the jail, for example. Because nobody else can really want to run or open a kind of private enterprises. So at that time, everything in shortage. 
If you can really learn a kind of private company, you can guarantee, almost guarantee you can make money. But nobody really wants to go there. And unless you have nowhere to, else to go. So if, for example, our people were just released from jail or can do, you have nowhere to find a job. Okay, just open kind of a small kind of a kind of a, uh, uh, the, the, the company and see some kind of a, even water, even kind of tea, and you can make money. But still, nobody, nobody really do it because according to another amount of time, and everybody was supposed to work for the state, for the people, and not for yourself, not for yourself. But then, by this time, and this actually kind of a, the government began to encourage and the people to build their own company, their own company. And uh, the, 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 the slogan actually really changed uh, to, uh, to get rich and glorious. This actually never hurt but in my life okay, until that time, until that time. So of course, the result of that, and plus, of course, plus, and they also introduced a lot of foreign com companies. So this kind of competition and further forced and those the state-owned companies also try to increase their productivity. So today, the situation completely complete changed. And uh, right now, China actually at least 70% of China GDP actually produced by the, uh, by the private enterprises. And also you can see, even though China is still poor, uh, you can see also see China has the, also have the second most the billionaire in the world today for those kind of private uh, uh, the, the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. Another policy, a very key policy for the, the economic change is the opening to the world. In China, before 1978, the Chinese economy was kind of one of the world's most isolated because China always really insists that and we got to be self-sufficient. So everything we, we, we need, that we can make myself or ourselves. We don't really connect with the whole world, whole, whole world. So after, again, after 1978, okay, the open goal policy became a China man development strategy. You know, uh, for, for some of you might, might see the, 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 uh, the TV and when the went to Japan and came to America and he visited and the Americans made companies and he was so interested and he was so impressed by the American economy. So that he really decided that we've got to do something to involve the Chinese economy into the world market. And we've got to really attract the more foreign companies into China. Because before that, and China's always worried about okay, the capitalist exploitation. You know, if we in, in, uh, welcome the foreign company into China and they exploit our workers, our laborers, right? And they make money and they, the, uh, the, uh, uh, exploiting our uh, workers. So they actually, before 78, almost no foreign investment in China at all. But after that, the China really adopted many, many kind of policies to encourage, to encourage and the foreign investment, the investment. And at this here, the special economic zones, or like the, like the holiday, tax holidays. And it provides all kind of a, the favorable uh, the term for foreign countries, or for foreign uh, companies. So for a while, I, I will say that maybe the China is the best place for foreign investment. Of course, no, no one, the China actually, for a while, China became the largest, the so-called FBI. FDI uh, 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 recipients, the foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment. So China actually for, for several years, China is the number one, you know, surpassed America. So right now it's the second largest and uh, the recipient of FDI and attract about $100 billion a year. So that's actually you will find, right? So it looks like everywhere, now today, everything made in China, looks like made in China. And if you go to the Walmart, you can see everything uh, made in China. Actually, the most of this kind of the, the products actually were produced by the American companies okay, in China. In China, okay. they just invest, and they because they can make money, as I'm going to talk uh, uh, later. On. So anyway, China also really became the one of the most open and kind of a, a, the, a, the market uh, uh, in, in, in China. So all of this, okay, uh, really, really have a great result. So that's why we talk about so-called emergence or re-emergence of China. And the Chinese economy grew 9.7% a year since 1978 and really surpassed Japan. 
to become the second biggest economy in 2010. So as I remember, and when I first teach, uh, uh, came to America, at that time, um, China's GDP actually even, even smaller than the, than the Dutch, in kind of very, very small, okay. But anyway, right now, you know, for uh, the start from 2010, we already became the second largest economy in the world. And also become the largest export in the world in 2009. And the second largest import country in the world, uh, just behind America. And also, by the way, maybe this year, China will surpass America, became the largest import country in the world. Because the China true that. Now they need so much, so much from outside. And uh, what do I mean? Okay, 9.7 percent. Okay, that's what. Uh, well, as I said, 9.7 percent a year. This kind of growth rate. This kind of growth rate. What does it mean? Okay, this means that okay, every seven point two years, the China economy, China GDP double, double. Okay. So over the past 35 years, since 1978 to now, it's 20, if we talk about 2011, and you can see this kind of difference here. Mm -hmm. I'm talking here, right? In 2000, only 10, 12 years ago, in 2000, American GDP is still 8.2 times at, um, at China. And uh, Japan at that time, of course, also much more, about four times of China's uh, GDP. But by 2011, you can see, right? This actually ch changed so, so, so fast. So now the American GDP is about 2.1 per, uh, times of China. And Japan actually far away, right? Far, far away, the left. You can see this is what they mean, this so-called uh, uh, the, 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 the emergence, the China's uh, re-emergence, uh, re-emergence. <coughs> of course. This is actually too much. I just give, give, give you a, uh, the, the example. And I said, China, everything changed after 1978. And uh, even I can, couldn't recognize that every time, even, even though I went back to China every, at least once a year, or sometimes two or, two or, or three, three times a year. Uh, but I couldn't recognize that what kind of, if, if this is China or not. Because so much changed, so many things have changed. Not only economic field, okay? Almost every other part of China, including human rights, okay, including human rights, including the kind of so-called democracy uh, rights. Okay. All this, of course, I, I, I don't have the time to, uh, uh, to, to go to detail. But almost, as I said, everything changed, in, even including the Communist Party, and also changed uh, uh, out of the recognition. But here, and uh, uh, this is not what I'm talking this is actually Shanghai, okay, this is Shanghai. You know, by the way, some, uh, the Shanghai also, this is a place uh, where before I, uh, I left China, okay, the same place okay, here, you know, because Shanghai is a Pudong area. This is actually kind of grassland, you know, all kind of rice land, okay, kind of agriculture land. But today, some of my friends, actually, American friends, and he visited Shanghai and he said, oh, really, right now, looks like uh, compared to Shanghai, New York, like a kind of village. Of course, really exaggerate. But it's true that the Shanghai and right now has even more sky rising and the high buildings. And uh, particularly because they are all new, much new, much latest, and all kind of built over the past uh, 15 years almost. So of course, you compare to New York, it even looks like much more. Uh, but anyway, so actually, we, of course, talk about China emerges. And of course, more important than that, what does it mean? What does it mean actually to America? And of course, or particularly for what does it mean to the, uh, as well, to the rest of the world, rest of the world. So that, of course, is kind of debating the controversial uh, the issue. And some people really worry about it. And if the Chinese, uh, Chinese emergence will threaten the America, uh, maybe even threaten the, to the world peace, world peace. And uh, but actually, this is not really true. Okay? This is not really true. And uh, actually, that just a couple of weeks ago, before I come here, okay, I checked this. <laughs> I saw the Clinton actually, anyway, the, uh, Obama also had a similar uh, uh, the, the, uh, statement. And Clinton also mentioned that okay, a prosperous China will benefit America, while a prosperous America will benefit China. That's true. And the strong rules of both America and China will benefit Asia as well as the world, whole world. So America actually right now is trying to cooperate with uh, emerging China 
and promotes China emerging as an active contributor to security, to peace, and to prosperity in the world. So this, I believe, this is kind of a, uh, the real, uh, the uh, right uh, the approach uh, in seeing about China, about China. So what's the actual significance of China's emerging today? That's what I will really talk about this, <laughs> at least at this way. There are many, many kind of uh, advantages. Uh, this many, many uh, the, the benefit uh, to America, to America today. And I just list a couple of them, okay, a couple of them. And uh, this actually has the greatest uh, uh, achievement of human history in fighting the poverty and big savings and all the handsome profits for U.S. companies and particularly for the market, for China, uh, uh, American market. I have the 1030, right? Anyway, let's talk about okay, what okay. you know, America, of course, right now, you know, America is the leader, the world the leader, the world the leader. So when we see this kind of China emergence, I think first we've got to let's see this kind of from the broader view, okay, not only from the kind of a, uh, the small uh, the, the point. The broader view, okay, we talk about uh, China, actually this kind of uh, the emergence, the really, you know, for America, you really need the world, you know, what, what, to prosperity. To the, 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 the riches of the whole world, the whole world. But the China has actually effort and China's result over the past 35 years. Actually, you can see this is the greatest the achievement of human history in fighting poverty. You know, this way we talk about, like a Britain started from the late 18th century, the British the, uh, industrialization. Then, and uh, this kind of industrialization actually really spread to the Western European countries. America, and then later on by the 20th, and uh, by the middle of the 20th century, and to go to Japan, go to like so-called South, the four little drug companies, small countries. So all combined together, and Western European countries, America, Japan, and other so-called developed small countries, combined together, about 800 million people, about 800 million people. So this already like fundamentally changed the whole world. And of course, America as a leader, and it has a kind of obligation or have kind of mission to really bring the whole world toward the same kind of a, uh, uh, the, the, the level, so that everybody, okay, everybody in the world can be as rich as America. Maybe that's why we the real world peace, the world peace. But China at least is that. If just imagine, if China also became kind of rich, became strong, and we talk about 1.3 billion people. So actually more than almost double of the, all the industrialized uh, the world. And it showed that the China, at, at, at least over the past 35 years, the China really won the greatest achievement of human history in fighting the poverty. It has more than, at least more than 300 million people really got rid of kind of absolute poverty. It has, it has, when we talk about absolute poverty, it really means that you even don't have the food to eat. You don't have a kind of, uh, the, the clothes to wear, the clothes to wear. And uh, also, just so many people just died of the kind of starvation. starvation. But this is actually absolutely true that today, as I said, at least because these 300 million people really got rid of poverty. Actually, over the same, in the same period, in the whole world, and the poverty, uh, the, the, the people, actually, population uh, live, living under the poverty line actually increased. Okay, increased and not a decreased. If without China, who knows how many more the people actually really live, living under the poverty line in today. And it's a bit hard to, to for American students to understand and what to mean in China, if it's called the, the poverty line, the poverty line. And also a rich China, China is much less threat to world peace and order later by America. Actually so far, America, China has really recognized and the, the kind of system, and America actually, uh, uh, the, the established, or America and the, uh, the Western European countries uh, established over the past two, two centuries. They really want to involve you. They really want to involve you, okay? So every China can also can help the America in various issues, like in Korea, or in Korea, or even in Iran. So this, of course, maybe it's a little uh, too broad. Uh, uh, but also, if you talk about the concrete, the issues, Again, and you can also find a lot of kind of a, a, a benefit uh, for America. Of course, first it's safe, a lot of money, save a lot of money. 
and uh, the call chain provider who can emerge the customer, cheap product, cheap product. And uh, in the, according to the, I think the, 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 the Goldman Sachs estimation, in the, every year the, the, the American the, 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 the import of the product is very thick, the American families. And about like 70, 80 million, a billion dollars a year, a year. Because uh, it's true that today uh, you can see everywhere uh, you can find something made in China. And I always say it's a big problem for me. Every time when I'm going back to China, what can I buy? A gift for my friends. Right? <laughs> <laughs> when every shop made in China. And of course, this is the one, 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 one issue. I think it's really quite true that and really think a lot and to, uh, for American uh, uh, customers. Or if we know the, the, the cheap, the Chinese products, and uh, how can people really afford, like for uh, iPhone, iPad? You know, anyway, according to the, uh, the, uh, the, the calcula calculation, okay, like for example, the uh, uh, iPhone. iPhone actually, now of course, it's really uh, example in China. In China, I will talk, give you an example there later. On. But if not example in China, and at least, and the price will, will increase 25%. Because China is the, the cheap, Russian cheap. But of course, not only for the, 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 this one, okay? but also, I would say, huge potential market for the United, American companies. Because unlike when I came, first came here, I would say, and uh, so the China only, only can provide uh, uh, the, the cheap products to China, uh, to America. But now, when China became rich, became rich, uh, at least, still, for not China, not everybody rich, okay? but at least, we talk about like 15% of Chinese getting rich and can pay, uh, the, uh, 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 can afford the Western style consumer products. What does that mean? More than America, okay? We talk about uh, 20%, maybe almost uh, the 300, 300, 300 billion people. So now it's true that, and there are many people right now can afford to buy and uh, Western style consumer products. And so, obviously, all this maybe can, you cannot believe, because the Chinese right now already become the largest market luxury products. And uh, by the way, okay, all the so-called luxury products are actually produced by European countries or by America. No Chinese company okay, really has a kind of uh, uh, the name, okay, kind of brand name uh, for attract Chinese. So I don't know if you have been in kind of a the, the, the kind of outlet uh, here in Massachusetts, right? Or like in New York, you can see there. You know, for the Chinese, the, the consumer, the Chinese visitors, the tourist people, uh, they really go there to buy some kind of crazy, really crazy, uh, like buy the coach, like right? some kind of bag, several hundred dollars, and they buy actually a dozen, not buy the one or two, okay? buy a dozen, because it's much cheaper, they saw it's much cheaper here. Anyway, so this actually really become kind of largest kind of luxury product uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the country. And also, also believe it or not, the China became the largest, world, world largest automobile market. Automobile market. You know, again, it's kind of big change. <laughs> you know, before I left China, China and uh, you can see the whole world, whole, whole country, you cannot find any single person who have a private car. Very, very, maybe a big couple of them, okay? Yeah. Almost you cannot find any single person okay, have a red private car. But today, China actually really surpassed America, became the largest car market in the world. In the world. And also, again, this is also another kind of a maybe sad story. And 90%, 95%, you can say, the cars actually made by the foreign countries, by foreign companies, and particularly GM. The GM actually here, right? They almost went to bankruptcy. Everybody really get, we went to bankruptcy. But in China, this is the best, okay, best company there. It had the largest share, market share. And the build, the GM right in Shanghai, there is a uh, factory. And they really provide the, the, the build, build the, uh, the car, okay? If you want to buy build in China, in Shanghai, you got to really wait for at least two or three months. If you want to buy it right now, you pay 10% premium. So this kind of, you can see, you really provide a good opportunity for American companies. And it's true that China's import really grew 10% annually. 
uh, from 20, 2000 to 2010. And also right now, you know, they uh, give some cut. Right now, as I said, China is now the second largest import country in the world. And also, according to the in, uh, in investigation or the calculation, and uh, this year, most likely, China will actually surpass America and become the largest import country in the world. So this actually provides a huge pro uh, the potential market for America, because actually this is a, you know believe or not, China, America actually. In China, and the very Chinese people have had very, very favor the impression on America. Because, they, of course, many, many reasons I don't have time to talk here. But at, at least because China and America has a quite long friendship, really time friendship uh, between China and the United States. In modern time, the America is the only one, only one Western country without really invade China and not actually really uh, fight China, okay? And actually, uh, America had helped China several times and to prevent the China from dismembering. You know, actually, it's true. In modern times, several times, China almost kind of uh, really taken uh, take apart and because of the Japan's invasion particularly and because other countries really want to like, get more uh, territory from China. So actually, America actually helps China in both sides. In 1900, the so-called open policy. And in 1930s, and when China, really, when Japan invaded China, and Japan really actually occupied a large, huge part of China. And almost all of the large cities, and the middle-sized cities actually were occupied by Japan. But anyway, with American help, and China won the war. So anyway, for this part, China and America have a long time of trip, uh, a friendship. Even though they have some kind of uh, unhappy uh, time in the Korean War, but the most time, okay, as I said, the Chinese, the Chinese people's, uh, people's uh, the, uh, the impression about America is very stable. So anyway, this is, uh, I think, uh, 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 Obama should have taken by 2010 to increase American export 15% a year in the next five years. This is kind of uh, America's target. They target how can we really reach how kind of rich is kind of target? And then China is kind of answer. Actually, China is more than 80 percent right, every year, every year. And uh, so, uh, from 2000 to 2011, American export to China increased 542 percent. You know, if we talk about that, compared to other countries, only 80 percent increase. But to China, 542 uh, 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 percent. And uh, China actually from the 16 billion to 103.9 billion dollars. Of course, you will say, okay, of course, China actually export even more. And uh, if uh, we can discuss later after that. Okay, this is uh, for the car market. Okay. Many com companies, large companies, and put the China uh, uh, as a big market. Here, actually, I've talked about the profit. They're not only talk about the, you know, as I say, yeah, yeah, you say, oh, so many, the, the, uh, the products are made in China. But actually, those products actually made in China, who actually made the most money? Actually, American company, okay, the Western companies. Like again, here is this kind of iPhone, and I said the iPad. The iPad is the profit distribution of the iPad. You can see that. And who made the most money? Apple. Apple really made like thirty percent. And how much Chinese actually really get? Two percent. The Chinese labor, okay, labor cost only two percent. In the all other parts, okay, actually, really not really made China, okay. And actually, most about 30% for the uh, uh, for Apple. And material cost them uh, a lot more. But the all other parts, okay, not really uh, uh, go to China. So this actually really provide the China, even this kind of product, okay, you say, oh, the China exports so much to, to America, and really uh, ruin the American economy. Not true, it's not really true. And if you really talk about it, the China consumer product, actually, only maybe made up about like less than two percent of Americans consumer uh, the, the spending, and if you want, I can have a calculation. So this actually really provides good, uh, high, huge profit uh, for American companies, and also high-paying jobs. <laughs> I don't have time left. Maybe anyway, this is for the, according to the the Apple's calculation. Okay? They believe that, and they not really. Export job, okay? They actually really brought a lot of job uh, to America, because you cannot say only Apple 
and the company's people, okay? They all have the other people and who are actually directly or indirectly related to the Apple company. So that's also part, uh, uh, part okay? They actually, the, the China actually can also provide a lot of uh, the huge or uh, high-paying high jobs for Americans. And service actually even more, okay? Because China's service industry is so backward. And that's actually really need the huge help from the Western countries, and particularly uh, America, particularly America. And uh, okay, this is uh, 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 our way we we'll talk. Uh, okay, sorry. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, sorry, uh, I just call to go back. Go back. No. Okay, <laughs> this, uh, that's all. Uh, uh, for finally, I, mean, I just want to talk about it. We don't have time. But anyway, I talk about it you know, for, for, for America. And uh, this actually is a good time. And this actually kind of potential that America can really get uh, the huge, uh, the huge, uh, yeah, the huge benefit from chance emergence. And uh, that's what I talk about, the opportunity, America opportunity. And thank you. And I'll...